All right, it looks to be about noon. Uh, so if we want to get started, um, Marco, do you want to kick us off? <laughs> sure. So um, this is the some presentations from the Space Governance Working Group. It's not that I'm a space governance uh, expert, but I have been participating in this group. We have a number of um, kind of projects that we want to share and, and there might be some broader uh, discussion. So given that my topic was uh, listed number as, as the first, I, I, I may start with that. So, uh, and then we will get a number of other topics, uh, projects that are, are presented, um, but let's, let's see what uh, what happens so okay so i will share my screen so um my involvement with uh, with space is coming uh, via the um, asu's interplanetary initiative where there is a group who is interested in uh, what happens if uh, uh, we have a colony on Mars uh, and then they they were interested in creating a game and they discovered that uh, common dilemmas uh, are a uh, key issue and that's how they uh, found me to uh, to be part of this project um, and so the the ASU's in planetary initiative provided some seed funds uh, for this. So the motivation is that uh, if we go to establish habitat on Mars, how do these people uh, manage their, uh, their shared resources? Um, no surprise maybe for the participants here, but um, the, basically the governance issues uh, are very much the same. There's one unique aspect is that you cannot leave um, like um, in the Earth situation, so the stakes are much higher. So we created a game that um, is, is um, I, it was not only for, for experimental, uh, perspective, but also as an uh, kind of entertainment uh, and educational perspective. So we had people from game design involved. This was an interesting interdisciplinary environment because the uh, the game designers want to make the game much more kind of complex than we typically do with experiments, but I think the result is uh, is in that way a novel type of approach. So the game as it is now, we have five players, will have different roles, but basically the same kind of, um, um, kind of payoff uh, structure. The idea is that they have to make the investments in the public good, which is the system health, like you have to create, uh, you have to maintain oxygen, energy, solar energy, etc. So you have to put in, you have to maintain the infrastructure to uh, to survive. But the also the individual players have incentives to do some other things. Every round, uh, the, there is wear and tear. You need to maintain investment in the system health to survive. If the, the, the games have incentives to, to get points for themselves, uh, because the, there is an incentive, there is an idea also of winning this game, uh, but um, they can only win if the, if the, the system uh, survives. And they don't know how long the how long how many rounds we have. Um, so we initially did a card game, uh, which we did uh, so a number of um, uh, sessions uh, in spring two thousand nineteen. As you can imagine, this is very labor intensive to do. So we in the end we had nineteen groups that we did it with and um, well the participants really 
uh, liked it. It was really fun. Uh, the idea is to have a uh, kind of a, uh, kind of a version that people may buy, but we we have to make some changes to make it possible doing it without moderation. Of the 19 groups, uh, 18 survived and one uh, group didn't make it. Um, and it's not that people earn money, they got some kind of gadgets that they could earn. But we published a paper about, uh, about this. Uh, the results are very much in line with traditional experiments. Uh, what was kind of new is that we had more, we, because we included events, um, unknown unknowns, uh, because we had ca cards which were events. Uh, this is a kind of a new way of thinking about uh, uh, risk and uh, making decision making uncertainty. He found that the groups were very risk averse. They want to avoid uh, uh, getting into, if the system health would be going down where more uh, bad things could happen. So they were very risk averse. Uh, the, the leadership um, as perceived by the participants uh, played an important role. And uh, we had some uh, uh, based on the surveys, we could say something about something about uh, personality traits, but we only had a, f a small sample size. So the next step is to create a digital version to increase the sample size. Uh, we can also capture better communication. And uh, we also start working with people from leadership studies to get uh, uh, more data about uh, about um, how people uh, approach leadership issues in this in this group. So we expect there will be more challenges in a digital version to maintain, to cooperate, because it's different than a face-to-face -face, uh, game. But we will find out soon. Uh, next week, we will have the first edition of Mars Madness. We have been pre-testing uh, the software for, for many months, uh, but now, we will see what is going to happen. We have, uh, we, uh, this is with ASU students. We are reaching out to a large number of classes, but of course we do not know what is going to happen. Um, um, the, one of the prizes, because we are not giving money as, as prizes, one of the prizes is uh, uh, the kind of the, the, the championship round, the, the group will end up in the championship round, they will get a dinner with a, with our astronaut in residence. We actually have an astronaut on our uh, uh, campus. So, um, so that's the idea. And we do the Mars Matters as a idea to, that it is fun to participate and to attract a large number of, of participants. So that's the, the kind of uh, a, a nice example, I hope, for connecting the commons issues with uh, space research. And um, I want to make one plug, which is also on the agenda for a conference that we will have uh, in a few months. Uh, this is part of the ISC uh, 2021 uh, kind of conference series because we do not uh, have the ability to uh, uh, do the uh, in-person conference probably. We, we don't know yet, but we have a series of conferences, uh, virtual conferences, and one will be about space. And uh, as part of the conference, you can also participate in the, uh, the Port of Mars uh, digital game. Um, but we, are, we have a broad uh, set of topics uh, in uh, also exploration and mining on the moon and other celestial bodies, managing Earth's orbit, sharing benefits of space exploration, dark sky movement. There is actually, if you look into it, there are a lot of topics uh, related to space. Um, I am living in a uh, community that is a dark sky movement. So uh, there are a lot of regulations about lightning, et cetera. <laughs> So there is, a, uh, I think this will be a kind of a new way of also bringing in people to comments issues that they may not have been aware about. So I will stop here and see whether there are any questions and whether our moderator has arrived. Yes, Scott, I see Scott is on the... 
Yes, indeed. I'm so sorry to be running late, guys. As I said, sound is a little bit of chance. So I could not hear what Scott was saying. So, but if there are any questions, maybe uh, people can put it in the chat. So, um, my understanding was that, uh, so hopefully you guys can at least hear me, if you can hear me, I'll just, yeah. Marco, would you rather have, oh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So would you rather have questions sort of rattled at you instead of a weird quiet room of chat? Um, um, well, I'm, I, I guess uh, uh, Scott is trying to, uh, yeah. to get to a different, so yeah, if there is some uh, people have uh, questions, yeah, space is out of space. So um, I know it's, uh, and so one of the, uh, benefits at the moment uh, is that uh, President Trump declared that uh, outer space is not a global commons. So that is really that a lot of people in this outer space space community are interested in this commons topic because it was uh, declared not to be a commons. So there's a lot of interest now. Okay, Brian may talk uh, later more about uh, this. So I do not know who is uh, listed uh, to, to go now. I guess uh, if somebody had a list of topics with this, I think the space debris was number the second. Yes, I, I guess the, the space debris uh, is uh, our project, right? Uh, okay. Yeah, so then may, uh, maybe you can uh, continue with uh, your presentation. Sure. Um, okay, so uh, let's do that. Uh, I'll, I'll present very, very briefly what's the uh, Space uh, Debris uh, Project. Uh, I think some of you might be already familiar because we had a prior discussion in the last few, uh, few weeks, few months. So I'll, then I'll provide you with a quick uh, update. Um, and I'll end uh, this call by, uh, by asking you a favor uh, and also making you a, a, an offer. So um, I'm not a space expert. I do international relations. I'm um, interested in international institutions. Um, and I'm especially interested in how a complex system of international institutions co-evolve uh, and, and interact over time. So my Previous research project has been on trade agreements, on animal agreements, on investment agreements, on intellectual property agreements. And I'm just starting this new project on, on, on space. Um, Scott is a collaborator on, on this project. It's a project funded by the um, CHIRC, so it's the Canadian uh, Research Council. Um, and Ethan also on this call is, uh, is, is working with me on this, uh, on this project. Um, and we uh, hired, um, I think you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we are currently at nine research assistants uh, right now. Um, so the main research question is how the 
uh, growing number of space actor, and also they're not only growing in number, as you know, but they also uh, getting increasingly more more diverse, uh, different types, different interests. Uh, how this growing community uh, basically affect the capacity of the community to govern space uh, space debris, and so it's an important project. Uh, and the first part, the first step is to collect data. So that's why we hired uh, uh, a number of research assistants to help us collecting data on, on first space actors and second on space uh, arrangements. So what are space actors? We define space actors as any organization, could be public, private, that design, own, launches, operates, tracks, monitors, uh, or regulates uh, basically any object in space. So it could be uh, an international actor, again, public and international organization, could be a public organization, could be a, a, a private uh, company, could be a university. Um, and we collect that on their size, on their location, on when they were created. Um, and then we also collect information on what we call arrangement or agreements, basically connecting different actors. Um, so arrangements could be, um, could be guidelines, could be treaties, could be codes of conduct. So we define arrangements as any um, institutional arrangement connecting two organizational actors, uh, voluntary. So, so we do not include um, regulation or laws, um, but we do include treaties and we do include contracts, for example. Uh, so far, we have identified 1,500, uh, so uh, 1,500 uh, actors and uh, 1,300, uh, 1300 uh, arrangements. Um, we don't have the full text for all of those arrangements. Uh, we collect information on them even though we don't have the, the, the actual text. Some of them are not public, but uh, we're looking at the archives here and there and we're hoping to get uh, as, as many arrangements in, in full text as we can. The second step uh, that will be in 2021 would be to conduct a network analysis. So we basically have actors that, and they are connected with, uh, with agreements. Uh, and, I, and I told you that I would end this short presentation by uh, asking you for a favor. We currently have a survey. For perhaps some of you, uh, you receive a, an email from, from us, from uh, Ethan and I. Um, it's, a, it's a one, it's a, micro survey it's a very short survey we ask only one question um what are the arrangements that you might be aware that we're not aware of knowing that we already have identified um 13 hundreds of them uh but i'm sure that there's people in this call who know about uh some could be an informal agreement could be some agreement that was concluded in the 70s um, related to not necessarily on, on space debris itself could be more more general than that could address vaguely um, space safety, for example. So uh, I will share perhaps in a minute uh, on the in the chat box the uh, the the link for this uh, survey. Um, and and it would be great if you can just if you can mention the name of the agreement. Or if you have the full text, then you can send it to us by, by email. There's an email address that we have. If you know what are the parties or the participating or the signatories to this uh, arrangement, that's even better. But we, uh, we will take everything that we, uh, you, you can share. So this is the, the, uh, 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 the favor that I wanted to ask you. But also, you know, we ha we're happy to, to share this data set. We're already thinking about uh, setting, uh, setting up a website where people will be uh, able to interact and to visualize the data set that will not be in the short term, that will not be the next 12 months, I think. Um, but eventually the data set will be public. But before making this data set public, uh, there's already, there's going to be a number of different research projects that can build on the same data set. So I do have my own research questions. My own research questions are related to innovation and, and where in the network of space factors, uh, innovation, especially legal innovation and regulatory innovation, uh, is more likely to appear. Um, and also how certain ideas and certain norms circulate in the network of factors. But uh, you might have other research questions in mind or on the other hypotheses. Um, so, you know, send it. I mean, this is something we can discuss in the next few, few weeks or in the next few months. Uh, you'll have uh, our uh, email address. 
um, we can we can discuss how we can share the data before it's made uh, before it's made public. Uh, we're uh, very open for uh, uh, very open to collaboration. Um, and there's also this call for paper that we currently have for a workshop that we uh, we hope to organize. Um, so I'm based in Canada. I'm in Quebec City, and we hope to organize uh, it next summer or next fall in 2021 in the middle of the forest to uh, bring together a group of people for a couple of days to uh, to discuss or share interest for for space governance. I don't know, Ethan, if you want to say a few words about this uh, this this call for paper. Oh, you're, you're uh, mute. Yeah, uh, so uh, this call for, for, for paper, uh, the deadline for the abstracts is uh, October 20, so it's one week from now, uh, but, uh, but for, the, for the members of this, uh, this work group, uh, we, uh, we can uh, extend uh, until the end uh, of the month. Um, and uh, uh, what we want to discuss uh, in uh, in this workshop uh, is the, uh, is the governance of a space exploration cor corporation uh, with a focus of the of their dual nature as a private corporations uh, on the one hand but as a would be what i call a, con a corporate sovereigns because down the road uh, they will have uh, powers that uh, are normally associated with uh, sovereign states uh, and I uh, in and the way I look at it I compare it to the cases uh, of the East India Company uh, and the Hudson Bay Company that uh, in the past uh, were the de facto government uh, of India and Canada uh, respectively and uh, so the the past cases uh, uh, were a distinct case where uh, you, you, you you had a corporation that was on the one hand working like a, a corporation, meaning like it, it had its business activities and uh, wanting to uh, bring money to its uh, shareholders, but at the, at the same time it was uh, it was functioning as as a government. Uh, having a, an army and courts and all the public administration, everything that a government does, uh, the corporation did. Uh, actually, in, uh, in, in India, the formal UK rule uh, began like a hundred years after the East India Company was working there. Uh, and India uh, joined the ITU uh, while it was actually ruled uh, by the East India Company. So it was a private company that signed an international treaty in the, uh, in the name of India. Um, so th this was the past, but uh, the more uh, the private sector is uh, taking the, the, the lead in the commercialization and later in the habitation of the uh, outer space, uh, we will have uh, similarities. We will have uh, companies that uh, control uh, parts of uh, celestial bodies, having factories, a space habitat, uh, uh, parts of orbits, and they might have uh, powers associated normally with with the states. And uh, and then the question is how to re regulate that. Uh, it is interdisciplinary. Any sort you have uh, how to address uh, this issue uh, is, is uh, welcomed and uh, uh, I can share uh, the call for the, the link to the call for papers uh, also in the chat box here. Thank you. So Scott is officially having uh, connection issues. So hello, Big my time. name is Raymond. <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna try to lead this parade a little bit. Um, I see here, uh, next on our agenda is the de the defense part of this. Milamos, is, am I saying that correctly? Apologies. The project, who's here for that? So, uh, Deborah uh, was supposed to present that, but she sent an, uh, an email that uh, she cannot uh, attend. Uh, okay. 
and she also sent some uh, some some links to the website of the McGill Institute of Air and Space Law. Um, actually, I can maybe say a few words about that. Uh, um, I am an okay. uh, alumni of the institute, and I know a bit this, this, this project. Brilliant! That'd be wonderful. And can you put her links in the chat box for people as well? And I'll try to capture the chat. Uh, when uh, we're done here so that uh, all these links will be available afterwards as well. So if you're not capturing them fast enough, I'll get these as well um, for everyone. So can you can you briefly summarize this project for us? Okay, so uh, one uh, one project that uh, is the is is the Milamos, which is the uh, McGill Manual of the International Law uh, uh, on uh, the uh, military uses of uh, outer space. Uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is not introducing new rule, it is basically, it's, it's, it's a basically a compilation. Uh, it is sur surveying all the rules that are already existing in international law, not just in outer space law, but in uh, international law in uh, general that apply to uh, military uses of uh, outer space. Uh, and uh, uh, it takes them all and uh, it uh, organizes them in uh, one uh, manual. And the purpose of this manual is that uh, one day when the, the legal advisors uh, of the US Space Force or any other Space Force will, uh, will want to, to, to do some uh, military uses of outer space, they will have a manual that they can refer to. So even if it's not a uh, legally binding because it's it's kind of academic work. Uh, uh, it it will be maybe the the only thing out there, and it and also its force will be because it is based on existing uh, uh, legal uh, treaties and uh, or, and obligations. Uh, so this is the Milamos, the the second project that she wanted to introduce, and the. The Milamos is a, is a, is a few years in the in the work. It is uh, supposed to be published in 2021. Uh, this, the second project that she wanted to introduce was the McGill Encyclopedia of uh, International Space Law, and this is a new project that was just launched like a month ago. Uh, and uh, like its title, the purpose is to create an uh, encyclopedia of. Uh, uh, international space law, uh, and like any other encyclopedia, there, there will be many uh, contributors. And, uh, and in her email, she invited uh, everyone who wants to join and contribute to email her so she can forward it to the editors. Thank you. And again, I'm going to capture the chat. So anything you want to put in the chat, I will capture it and we will get it out to the appropriate listservs and stuff so you don't have to try to navigate all these links that are um, very helpfully being added to the chat. So I see next, I have the Commons in Space Conference. Who's going to speak about Well, that's, I already included that in my, my little talk, yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah, so yeah. don't forget there's been, um, a uh, flyer that went out that actually all these links work. Hence why I'm very quickly being able to catch up as fast as I can. Um, how about the Open Lunar Foundation? Um, yeah, that's me. Uh, hi. Hello, Lucas. Um, <laughs> I had to jump in for Jesse Kate. I hope everyone was able to catch up with her uh, TED talk that we just recently published. Um, yeah, about the Lunar, Open Lunar Foundation, we basically, our goal is it to co-create value-driven norms and policy set. And to do that, we want to work with all kinds of stakeholders. So our main project right now is the um, Moon Dialogues, uh, in which we have monthly talks with all um, yeah, we basically just invite all kinds of stakeholders for relevant topics of, of, of uh, lunar activities. For instance, we just recently held a talk on uh, lunar infrastructure and we try to connect uh, industry policymakers, 
academia and just the general public like me when I first joined um, the Moon Dialogues. So yeah, what we came up with so far is kind of a set of principles or rather um, goals and, um, and concepts that we want to use or that we think are useful for the governance, uh, uh, governance of, the, of the moon. And those are uh, definitely cooperation, agency, learning, so we want kind of an adaptive governance system, um, interdependence, which kind of plays into the whole polycentricity idea. And um, for that, it's also very useful, at least for me, with my background in, in, in comical resource governance, um, to, to use the CPR uh, governance principles by Ostrom, which fits very well, I guess. Uh, then subsidiarity, again, uh, the, con the congruence aspect of the, of the CPR principles. Um, diversity should be a goal in and of itself on the moon. Access, obviously, especially with the Outer Space Treaty and uh, the, the freedom to use access and explore space and the moon. Uh, stewardship, because we want, really want to use the moon sustainably. And lastly, protocols, we want a bottom-up approach that we kind of um, live with the, with the moon dialogues. Um, yeah, basically by that, we want um, to explore governance systems and policies by collaborating with all all actors that have the potential or are already engaged with uh, business or activities on the moon. And therefore, interdisciplinarity is an important asset for us. We work on policy work, we work on norms, we work on engineering. We have um, recently uh, written up a piece on design and infrastructure and uh, yeah, that's, that's basically what we do. I really recommend the Moon Dialogues. Everyone that, that hasn't been should, should definitely come along. It's always the uh, full moon. The next one is, I think, on Halloween, which is a blue moon, uh, which is going to be really cool. Um, yeah, and if anyone has any questions, feel free to contact us through the website or, um, yeah, that, that's basically it. Thank you. I'm super excited about the moon on Halloween as well. Perfectly creepy. Uh, the last one that I have on my list is the recovery and use of um, space resources. Is that person here? That's, I'm going with a no. We're having a little bit, it looks like Scott's not the only one with, that's having a little bit of internet connectivity issues, just so you know, I have to keep letting some people in. So um, why don't we open it up for questions and conversation then? This is um, a growing, I had no idea there were this many uh, different projects that were um, circling around in terms of space. Um, many, many, many moons ago, haha. Uh, I worked on uh, the convention for space assets. And at the time we stood in a room and said, uh, no, no satellites and had a whole conversation about whether or not they're in space or not. And then a whole second conversation about if space assets are um, financed through the traditional secured transaction system, how will we ever reseize the collateral? Will we have to go up and get the satellite? And that was the moment that we all realized we weren't in Kansas anymore and everyone needed a good update on how these type of things work. So I've, uh, forever been interested in the conversations about space because it was a much different conversation than I thought I would ever have. Um, so I'm I'm curious if individuals have questions um, for this incredibly knowledgeable group. Um, I'll keep an eye on the raise hand function uh, if people and I see there's some stuff uh, that's popping up in the chat as well and I may need to read some stuff for you because again we're having a little bit of internet connectivity issues here. Um, so Brian's asking, Marco, what kind of feedback did you get from initial game uh, participants and how did it influence design and di digital game? So the people really liked uh, the, 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 the game. Uh, they also 
I have to say a lot of it's we try to get uh, also funding to for getting this to k-12 education because this might be a way to get people if i if i go to uh, uh k-12 education to talk about uh, the comments and have a game on uh, uh, water in india that is less enthusiasm than having a card game uh, uh related to mars um so what what was the main challenge is that it was uh, not really scalable because it's a pretty complicated uh, uh, game so you had to have at least two moderators and it's uh, surprisingly if we schedule these kind of uh, card games it's not that people all show up when they say they will show up so that's why we had to have a different approach so the, the basically the game is very much the same uh now that we uh, uh have it that we start uh, do that event next week but we try to we see this as an opportunity to go to larger groups to also uh connect it with with education uh on uh, uh, also uh, space governance we had a uh, there is also interest from nasa uh, in this uh, uh, game, and so, so I, I think there is a we have different directions, whether it's education or more fundamental research on on the comments. Uh, so there are different kind of approaches. We cannot at the moment pretest uh, uh, a game, the card game version that we, if we want to make this. Uh, adjusted to make this available for others we have to pretest again and that's not really possible at the moment given the that the universe is basically closed so yeah so another question in the chat i heard that there is a potential satellite collision that could occur this week who has information about this <clears throat> true or false you know last i knew so there's thousands and thousands of satellites uh so the so the first question is the use of the term satellite actually means different things to different people sort of cool right Hi, this is brian i can yeah. put a little yeah, shit so go yeah so there's um is it, there's on the order of twenty five thousand things bigger than a softball whizzing around um there are various government and this today private companies tracking that stuff one of those leo labs that victoria just linked in there uh, they're a company that runs uh, some some privately operated radars. Um, they're basically they're predicting that a couple of things might are going to come within 50 meters uh, later today, and the plus or minus on that is like plus or minus 150 meters. So the probability of collision is somewhere around five to ten percent, um, which is you know doesn't mean it's going to happen, but that's extraordinarily high probability given how often this sort of thing happens. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a real close approach that we call. Uh, we don't have the, the accuracy right now in the SSA world to be able to tell definitively whether or not two things will collide. All we can do is simply say, there's a gonna come close, here's a probability, you know, everyone cross your fingers and, and hold it. Um, I think the point they're trying to make is this stuff happens kind of all the time. There's uh, some uh, old Russian rocket bodies the size of double-decker buses that occasionally come within 100 meters of each other uh, at like 850, 900 kilometers altitude, which is pretty scary. Uh, and there's a kind of a push from the scientific world to try and get governments to do more about thinking maybe removing some of these big debris objects. That's it. Thank you. The, the general chat seems to have gotten quiet. Um, I have a I have a question for the group. So Scott's obviously organized you and go ahead and put another chat in right. I'm happy to answer, you know, get my own questions answered. But if you have questions, please ask. Scott's obviously organized you into a, a group um, for a purpose or for a reason. And obviously, one of those things is always, you know, networking opportunities. But what do you guys see as the as the next sort of thing that's going to happen amongst this group? Are you hoping to continue to have meetings or what are you looking from, especially amongst yourselves, but then you have a pretty good larger group here. Is there something you want from them as well? 
and anyone, I think I've made the functionality so you can unmute yourself whenever you want at this point. Well, then I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to make a listserv and a working group and we have to get together more often, right? When, um, you know, these are, space is going to be one of the, it should have been a conversation that we had a long ago, right? Before we already had planted a flag on the moon and someone's laying claim to it, um, in my opinion, totally my opinion. Um, but so, you know, I'm going to lay claim to the fact that we should definitely, you know, keep this, this group going in these conversations because the people that are on this call um, obviously are the people who should be having these conversations. Um, Scott, someone's asking about uh, the future direction of a Biden space policy. Well, late in question, but anybody have an opinion on the thoughts of the future director and uh, direction of the Biden space policy? I do. Um, uh, I, I, I have a comment that is connected to that and to, uh, and, and to what you, uh, you said b before that uh, Trump, uh, that uh, Trump uh, uh, declared that the outer space is not uh, global commons. So uh, first, uh, uh, the news, I think it was yesterday that uh, uh, NASA declared that there were, I think, 11 states that, uh, that signed the Artemis uh, Accords and the part of the, and the Artemis Accords, which uh, uh, refer to the, uh, to the Artemis program to the uh, return to, to the moon. They also include a part of the uh, utilization of uh, uh, outer space uh, resources. <clears throat> um, so uh, it seems that the, the, the US is uh, managing to, to, to push its uh, position uh, on it. Uh, in terms of the global commons, uh, it's, it's not a, a new, voice uh, from from the us in 2015 uh, um, uh, brian whedon and and the two others uh, already made a pre pre presentation at the isc uh, talking about that the uh, art space is not uh, uh, gl uh, global commons and uh, the point of that as i understand it is not so much uh, in the commons that uh, that the Ostrom workshops is uh, like the what I call the the economic commons, but more of uh, uh, saying that it's not a legal commons uh, uh, in the sense that uh, you might have a private property or or types of private property to outer space resources. Um, this policy, uh, so if you can see the origins of the year and 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 who is it coming from uh, it's not uh, just the trump uh, policy so uh, i would imagine that it will stay even uh, if the administration uh, changes yeah i'm happy to follow on to that uh, if it's okay uh, yeah so the paper is referring to something that uh, i and a couple others wrote again three four four five years ago somewhere in there um the word and it relates to the um uh, the executive order that was mentioned earlier. Um, the word commons in the space world gets tossed around a lot and, and has, uh, you know, different legal, economic, and sort of political meanings. Um, there's, uh, for example, uh, in the Moon Agreement, uh, they talk about the concept of the common heritage of mankind and that uh, you know, any resources pulled from the moon or celestial bodies should be shared equitably with all countries and that that needs to be done under the guidance of a, a regulatory framework set up by, 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 by the UN or international group. Um, that is really what the Trump executive order was, was talking about, was that there's a, I say, a, say a strong libertarian component in the space world um, that would prefer to see private sector activities going into space. Uh, I think the point we are trying to make with our, uh, with our paper is, you know, space is probably a mix of different economic models. Uh, you know, outer space as a whole, I, I think probably is a, a global commons, but then there's probably common pool resources and private 
uh, economic frameworks that are nested within that. That's sort of what I was trying to make in that paper is that it's not a one size fits all sort of thing. Uh, look, the, the Trump EO, I mean, that was sort of, uh, you know, the, the people that were behind that have been trying to push that for a long time to undermine support for the Moon Treaty. Um, fine, I should say that the Artemis Accords, I, I put a link to the actual press release. Um, this is the set of bilateral agreements between NASA and all the countries that want to participate in the Artemis program to go back to the moon. There are eight countries. Uh, what's interesting is Australia is one of those who is a signatory to the moon treaty. And so the Australian government has basically said that what the principles laid out in the Artemis Accords in their interpretation are not, are not uh, don't run afoul of what they've signed up to under, under the moon uh, treaty. Um, under the moon agreement and basically it comes to resource somebody says the u.s position on this has been the same since the mid 70s you can extract ice or regolith from the moon and use it to build stuff or fuel rockets and that extraction and use is not appropriation right that does not mean you have a deed to the land that, that's what they're trying to get again there's this is a hugely complex subject that has been debated in ad infinitum in the space world that we can talk about sort of later on but that's that's sort of what's going on Other comments or thoughts? Thank you for that, th both of those summaries. That was really insightful. Other comments or so I'm gonna remind people on the call that there is a very active uh, chat stream happening here with tons of links and stuff. And um, I will capture those, but if, if you know something is striking your attention right away, you know, the links are there. <clears throat> so we've got another question here. To what a degree are the semi-commons, Smith, uh, the Smith type uh, arrangements or other arrangements like, oh, sorry, moving fast, uh, Dagan or Heller's liberal commons useful for considering governance of various different kinds of resources in space? <clears throat> Brian or Marco, do you have a comment about... I'll, I'll just say I, I'm well. Just quickly, I, I I'm not sure what a semi commons is. I'm, I'm a public policy guy and a space guy, so I'm happy to be educated. Yeah, I'm not sure either about this particular definition, but I I agree with uh, the early discussion that the interesting part of space, if you start looking into it, is that there are many different type of issues, and so uh, that's what makes it interesting and. Uh, we and we often uh, focus uh, at least if with natural resources to communities, but commu communities are completely different in a space uh, context. Um, so so that makes it uh, it and also our ac activities on Earth. So this, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the dark sky movement is a an interesting area too. So it's also what we do here on planet earth in a way uh, impacting uh, uh, for for those who want to have a dark sky for various reasons so yeah there are um, a lot uh, of of um, but not only legal issues but also from community perspective on different dimensions there are uh, challenges of uh, of shared resources Okay, anyone else want to comment? <clears throat> so I'm gonna, there's another question that's popped up. Does the combination of Article 1 and Article 2 of the OST not suggest that space is a common? Does it not only suggest that if we use the goods matrix, all goods in space must only be public goods and CPRs? Hi, this is Victoria Sampson with Secure World Foundation. Um, I mean, there is definitely not 100% agreement about whether space is a global commons and what the uses of space resources are. Um, I know the Europeans have a slightly different perspective. There's a space mineral resource working group that comes out of the University of Leiden in Netherlands that Secure World has been involved in that um, came up with a set of building blocks for principles for using it. But I think that the larger point is that even though people may not agree that space is a global commons, there is definite, uh, to a certain extent, some parts of space is a public good. Um, it comes out, 
up a lot in our work when we're talking about things like space debris, debris removal, space situation awareness, that sort of thing. To a certain extent, some aspects of space are public good and that's where government responsibilities come in. But it doesn't mean that there, are, there aren't ways in which to have the commercial and private sector involved. And I guess the, the threading the needle is a hard, uh, that's where the challenges come in. And that's where uh, discussions like this governance group can be very helpful. Can I ask a silly question? I mean, this is how much, I mean, so how much is space and the conversations we're going to have going to be dependent on, or at least part of a, a comparison with oceans? And, I, and I'm honestly curious, it, it's, it's not a, you know, it's, it's not a loaded question. And then my other question is that, it, because when, and in, anytime you start getting national security and national defense mixed into a commons, it makes an interesting conversation. So what do you guys, you know, how much is that going to impact and, and limit, quite honestly, the transparency and authority and, and the ability of a commons uh, conceptualization to work in space? And I, I don't mean that as a loaded question. It's an honest, talk me through this a little bit. So again, this, this is Brian again. Uh, I've done a lot of work on the concept of space traffic management. And when you get into that discussion, there's a lot of comparisons with the air world and ICAO and the maritime world and the evolution of maritime norms. Some of those analogies are useful, some of them are not. Uh, for example, the, the, the or mechanics and the physics of space are just make some of that stuff not applicable. Um, but, but some of the ways that that evolved, uh, right? So for example, ICAO came about because of conflicts between national regulatory regimes for air traffic. And so they needed an international institution to create international standards. Um, some people propose that as a model for space traffic. Uh, one of the challenges is that we don't even really have any national frameworks for space traffic at the moment. It's all sort of a, you, you get a license before you launch and once you're on orbit, there's not a lot of hands-on stuff. And 95% of the stuff on orbit is not under control. It's all dead objects just going around and around and around. Uh, so, so yeah, there, there's a lot of discussion about that, um, but, uh, you know, again, I would say that's 100% analogous to those domains. There's been a couple other, um, a little bit longer questions here. Um, so there's been some elaboration, I guess, on the semi-commons, liberal commons, and um, the the conversation is something along this lines of as it, it's a nuanced alternative to the absolutionism uh, and the ambiguity of the global commons language. And so the question is, what if that's a theoretical perspective on these alternatives at the end of, um, and he makes the argument that he's suggested, he's written about this in 2015. So is there an argument that, that if we soften, I, I hate to over paraphrase, but if we soften the language a little bit, from this idea of a global commons that seems to be definitive and absolute and open it up to more of an idea of a semi, uh, semi commons, might that allow us to expand the conversation into the various areas that it seems that people are suggesting uh, we need to consider? Comments on? Well, a more general comment about the, the term commons is often uh, uh, problematic and, and, and I'm the president of the ISC which is about the commons. So uh, it, it doesn't really uh, help often to, uh, to use the term commons. It might be more precise to talk about shared resources and then there are different w uh, ways you can organize governance of those shared resources. So, uh, but yeah, traditionally commons have a they, they have a particular historical meanings, but it's, it can be, uh, uh, be, a, be a challenge to, uh, to apply that to other topics. So I would prefer, I typically prefer the, to use the term shared resources and then think about how that can be organized. So because commons is it too, too vague in that way. Mike is commenting in the in the chat box as well, so I think he's one of the people that might be suffering a bit from um, the Zoom difficulties that we're having here. Um, I'm not going to read that out loud because we are beginning to run out of time, and I want to be sure that no one has a sort of a final word 
um, uh, either a call out or um, you, you know that you want to be sure people saw in the in the chat box that that you had posted information if anyone has sort of one of those final words. And again, I'll capture this chat, so it's why I asked to be made co-host really quickly, so I can capture the chat, and I will ensure that people are uh, have access to the links. And I also want to tell you that Scott, I think, has officially now fallen off completely. Um, did tell me that the idea is, in fact, to have this be the first of what they hope, what he hopes to be many meetings of individuals joining together. Uh, and the way that we traditionally do that is that you would, you know, you do these intros and, and everyone gets to know a little bit about some key people and opportunities. And then we organize a bit around either specific topics or specific interest areas that seem to um, permeate the group in general. Um, so I'm sure he would love to hear if someone had, you know, hey, in the next meeting, can we talk a little bit more in detail about X, whatever it is. Um, but does anyone who's spoken today or anyone else want to take a couple seconds to, to do a final word before we officially run out of time for the day? <clears throat> I know apologies for the really dodgy internet connection. I can see people coming and going very quickly. So I know that's, that's a little bit of a disjointed session. And for those of you who are suffering at the hands of that, but nonetheless stuck with us, I think it's fair to say thank you very much for doing that. Um, I do know that can be frustrated. I, uh, frustrating. I can tell you IU in general today is having a little bit of an issue with some of our tech. Um, and I can say that with a level of certainty. Um, so if you're in Bloomington, good luck the rest of the day. Um, but otherwise, nobody has something. I don't see any hands popping up. Nobody's microphone's going off really quick. So I'm going to call the meeting officially to an end and thank Scott and all of our presenters today for being part of this. Uh, this recording will undoubtedly be posted somewhere, but I'll tell you, you're probably better off to look up a summary of this. The video is going to be choppy probably as well. But I do want to thank everyone for joining. And this is an incredibly interesting group. I look forward to attending and learning from all of you uh, in the next, the next set of meetings. So thank you very much. Thank you, Angie. Thanks, everybody.